You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Hello, hello, my friends, and welcome to Pets Mean Business on Pet Life Radio. I am your host, Dustin McAdams. As always, thank you for taking some time out of your day to join me. Our focus today is on marketing, marketing in the pet industry, a $63 billion market growing at over 5% a year. It's a pretty darn healthy market. In fact, Jim Cramer of CNBC's Mad Money recently stated that pet humanization is the greatest investing theme in the market right now. That's a hell of a big statement. So what's it mean for you and me? Well, one, there's a lot of opportunity. And second, as with any big healthy market, it's going to drive a lot of competition. You have to know how to connect with folks efficiently and effectively. And that, my friends, isn't easy. I know firsthand. I've spent over a decade in advertising and marketing, working with some really big brands, yet I still feel like every single day that I'm learning on the job. Social channels are complicated and rapidly evolving. Our friends over at Google like to keep us on our toes by routinely changing up search algorithms and paid advertising rules. You've got affiliate partners to manage, social influencers, publications, public relations, you name it. And you have to factor in major trends in the industry like humanization, transparency, and health and wellness. It's certainly complicated. It's not easy. But if it were, everybody would do it. But if you do it right, there's a lot of opportunity in our market. So that's where we're going to focus today, marketing in the pet industry. And we have a great guest to provide us some guidance and expertise on it. He's Chris Walker, the founder of Retaliate First, a New York City agency that works with a number of pet brands, including my own company, PupJoy. And they have a lot of core expertise in digital marketing to pet owners. Chris also has a really extensive background in the market as the founder of Woofopedia, which grew to over 1.5 million users, and then as the head of marketing for the American Kennel Club, where he helped lead their digital transformation. And maybe most importantly, Chris is also dad to an adorable golden retriever named Teddy, who has a pretty big social following himself. While we go off to a quick break, you can find Chris online at retaliatefirst.com. That's retaliate, the number one, S-T dot com. And on Twitter at we retaliate first. And of course, if you want to check out Teddy, he's online as well on Instagram at Teddy Hugo Walker. That's Teddy H-U-G-O Walker. We'll be right back with Chris after these messages. I love cleaning the litter box, said no one ever. Luckily, there's World's Best Cat Litter, the litter that promises less mess with less litter. Only World's Best Cat Litter uses the concentrated power of corn to quickly trap odors in tight clumps. And quick clumping means you never have to chisel or scrape the box. Less cleanup with less wasted litter? That's a litter bit amazing. Save $2 on World's Best Cat Litter. Visit www.saveonworldsbest.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Pets Mean Business on Pet Life Radio. With us now, pet marketing expert Chris Walker. Chris, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. So I guess first we should, uh, we should tell everybody in the audience, where's the accent from and how'd you get into dogs? Super broken, originally from Belfast, Northern Ireland, uh, via London, and then uh, here since 2006, I believe I, I moved over here. So it's it's been a long time, and I'm a, I'm a lifelong owner. I'm what I like to call a two three generation breeder. Um, what I mean by that is that uh, I'm second generation, but the uh, the middle generation was kind of skipped. It's one of those things that you see in in dogdom quite a lot, where the children of breeders kind of. Uh, stray away from it, and then you kind of get uh, the generation below it. So uh, Golden Retrievers have been a, a part of my life ever since I was probably three, four. Uh, my grandfather kind of, uh, he originally started with Kerry Blue Terriers, and then, uh, as you know, they're a little bit of an aggressive breed. So when the grandchildren came, uh, my mother and her sisters forced him to kind of move over to a more uh, family-friendly breed, and <laughs> uh, we, we grew up with Golden Retrievers our, our whole life. So yeah, just all, had them my entire life except for sort of my, my first five years in the city, sort of uh, coming here and working hard in, in the sort of micro apartment in, in New York kind of thing. It made it a bit hard, but, you know, we've been blessed to have a bit of space now. So, hence, Teddy's been with us the last two years, and, and he's the, the apple of our eye. So 
Uh, Teddy's pretty adorable. So I told the audience uh, before we brought you on, uh, Teddy has a bit of a social following himself. And if anybody missed it before, you can find Teddy on Instagram at Teddy Hugo Walker. Really cute. Adorable guy you got there. So you were the guy behind Woofopedia. And uh, for anyone listening who doesn't know Woofopedia, really big content site in the pet space. How'd you get started and how'd you build it? Really what it was, was it became so important. You know, the, the challenge that was there, you know, in my time at the American Kennel Club was, you know, you were really in this deep political environment and, and you needed this ammunition and this arm to effectively reach the pet parents and uh, sort of the new model. So Wolfopedia started, uh, you know, originally on its own as, as just a real kind of cool content engine just for, for people that were just obsessed with, with pet parenting and, and just getting those kind of tips. And then ultimately, it, it became what, what I called the uh, the counterculture brand of the American Kennel Club. It was kind of the brand that I felt that really pushed them and kind of helped them sort of evolve and adopt to become to become more relevant. And, and uh, as I'm sure we'll touch on, the, the challenge there was was kind of great. You know, it was 25 years of decline, and and I think Wolfopedia was really the driving force that sort of put them back on on the path to growth and, and the digital and led the sort of digital transformation and, and moved them into being a little bit more of a, a pet parenting company rather than a, a sort of a traditional breeder dog show uh, community. Interesting. So again, for everybody, so Chris both was behind the buildup of Woofopedia and also ran marketing at American Kennel Club for quite a while. So at least in my mind, and I think probably with a lot of listeners, um, those are very different personas in terms of brands. And so talk about a little bit of of dealing with that one were they distinctly different in the audiences and the, in the brand and if so what did you guys what were the efforts to try to mesh those together make them work cohesively so i am like you know my background in, in marketing i study cultures i study historical things i look at things that like that everything has ultimately been done before and the guiding principle for this to show you a little bit of my my nerdy side actually comes from the professional wrestling world <laughs> uh, where you had a really steel brand in World Championship Wrestling that was really getting its butt kicked by WWF. And they came out with a thing, a concept called the New World Order that they made seem like it was driving and cool and it was hip and that ultimately was not held by the uh, boundaries of TNT, who were the company that was you know producing and, and showcasing the wrestling. And that was the inspiration for Wolfopedia. It was how do we create a brand that does not tie us to... Uh, succinct messaging, does not tie us to a core audience, and does not kind of put us in a box on places that we couldn't go. You know, I always tell the story how I I was almost, I think I was the fourth or fifth sort of chief marketing officer they had in in a short period of time there. And I was kind of really the last roll of the dice, right? You know, can we get someone from sort of tech startups and, and that kind of opportunity there? And sort of the second week in, we had this huge um, calamity where a person on my team that was overseeing sort of, you know, just posts on Facebook, posted a picture of a silver Labrador. And all of a sudden we had the Labrador community being like, this is not a recognized breed. This can't be in a dog show. They were calling for everybody's heads. So hence where Woofopedia became really, really critical. And you were able to kind of do things on Woofopedia and kind of almost hold that up as a disclaimer of like, well, that was on Wikipedia, that wasn't core AKC. And it allowed us to reach this new audience that was so critical for them to grow. You know, the American Kennel Club has been challenged demographically. You know, the, the average age of the constituents is, is in their early 70s now. And, and when I joined, it was kind of going up by 0.8 per year, meaning that they were really struggling wow. to attract a new audience. So Wikipedia give you that more edgy, more young millennial driven brand that allowed, allowed you to really build a cohort and a cluster of what is a, a really lucrative audience for for people um, you know that want to get into the pet space that want to market in the pet space it's, it's what we dubbed empathetics right it's really that millennial audience that look at look at um, dogs as their children they maybe haven't had a child yet but you know the dog is their child and, and they want to you know they want to spoil it they want to raise it they they really believe in, in the dog as a, as a human, as a sentient being, as the, the scientific term is. And that's, that's that sweet spot that you really want to target. You know, those are people that have a disposable income of about $1,300 that they're willing to potentially spend on their dog per month um, if the right companies get in front of them with the right message. 
interesting. And I think that part is very important for our audience and really is the focus of what we're talking about today, which is how do we reach audiences, grow brands, and generally market in the pet industry. Chris, we're going to take a quick break. And folks, we will continue with Chris right after a couple messages from our sponsors. Hi, I'm Dana Humphrey, the founder of Whitegate PR. We have been specializing in PR and marketing in the pet industry for over 10 years. If you have a pet product or service you would like to promote, give us a call. We can help create awareness for your brand on TV, radio, magazines, newspapers, and blogs. Feel free to reach me directly at 619-414-9307 or learn more on our website at whitegatepr.com or follow us on Facebook. July 25th, 2006, we adopted April. She's a purebred, orange and white, Brittany. But when she started scratching like crazy, I said to John, it's got to be her food. You know, what you put into a dog is what you get out. We heard this radio commercial, and this woman was so excited about Dynavite. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. 859-428-1000. I said to John, I'm getting this. So the Dynavite comes, and I thought, a light bulb moment. She loves her dog food. She always leaves a little bit in her bowl. So we had a huge scoop of Dynavite in it, and then we swished it around like gravy. She dove into that bowl. She licked it clean. She loved it. So that's been the routine for almost 10 years. April gets Dynavite for dessert. Her coat is now soft. It's silky. It's smooth. She even walks like a little princess. 859-428-1000. On Dynavite. She's Little Miss Hollywood. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. Let's Talk Pets. Let's Talk Pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Dot com. All right, folks, we're back with marketing guru, Chris Walker, talking about growing brands, growing audiences, and customers in the pet industry. So, Chris, when we left off, you were talking a bit about the challenges that the American Kennel Club had, some of the goals that you guys had with Woofopedia. During your duration there, what were some of the biggest transitions you saw with the way that the AKC was approaching the market and just generally the demographic growth? The biggest challenge was riding the wave. Um, You did a really good sort of introduction to it when you you talked about the growth in the sector, you know, up to a $69 billion a year industry. It's the fourth largest one that hasn't necessarily been touched by the venture money. So the challenge really for the AKC was it was not to kind of look at the misnomers out there. They should have been growing based on the growth of the space, right? Being the the old one in the space, they were always going to acquire part of the market share, but the key thing was looking for that rapid growth and that ascension to really become kind of the thought leaders in the space. And I used to keep this board in my office. I called it the distraction board, right? And I, it's basically, if you think of it in, a, in terms of a cross, and it's kind of internal, external, negative, positive, right? Yep. And never below, never at any of my, my time at the AKC did we ever have 90% of the distractions were all negative and internal. And that was always their biggest challenge was the core constituency and what the core constituency had had been looking for. You know, that, that world of dog shows, that world of, of purebred only and, and that breeding, it, it leads to a very kind of political climate, a, a very much sort of a, a right-left, Democrat-Republican kind of approach. And I think as we've seen in the 2016 election, that became sometimes people don't want to give in or don't want to concede, particularly as news media and technology has moved us into this, this headline, top-of-the-mind articles. And I think that that was always their biggest challenge was how did they evolve to become relevant in the way that people are now interacting with dogs, right? You know, like one of the biggest things we faced was was the outside attacks and, and the elements that they would see from HSUS or ASPCA. And that was something that, that truly I don't think, you know, personally that, that they're able to kind of evolve and understand that those guys are not the core enemy. But, you know, they are one side of the spectrum, but the true thing that the people need in this space is, is that kind of center grind, that animal welfare of like ultimately putting the dogs first. And that's where the audience has become so important. The customer has become so important because that's what all people care about. They love their dog. They want to treat their dog. They want to spoil their dog. They want to have a great life of their dog with their dog, you know, and, and that is what pet ownership is now, right? And, 
you know, that's the, the challenge that every sort of brand has is like, how do you reach those core people? How do you differentiate yourself to them? And how do you ultimately show yourself as a value add to your dog? You know, one of the biggest challenges that vets have always faced is, you know, when they're actually diagnosing a dog, the dog's not able to speak or give a true opinion of what's, what's wrong with the dog. And that's, that's the same with people entering the product space, right? You're, you're not going to see those moments of where the dog's really happy and be a repeat customer. You're relying on, on, on the human to kind of make that decision. And therefore, it really is key to kind of get your brand right, get your messaging right, understand who you are and what's your kind of core audience, and ultimately finding those people. You know, that's why we focus a lot on the stuff that, that we do with you and, and with some of our, our other clients in the space, really kind of understanding who is your core consumer, who's your core audience, and don't necessarily look at their demographics. Look at the behavioral elements. Look at how they, they maneuver around the space, what they look at, what they're interested in, you know, because it's, it's finding those cohorts. We focus a lot on, as I mentioned, empathetics and then enthusiasts. Those are kind of an older audience that, you know, the dog is, has fulfilled kind of like the, the empty nester vibe maybe when the kids have gone off to college. You know, those are two great groups, you know, of, of people that really love dogs, really want to kind of have a great relationship with their dog. But it's finding those behavioral niches am, amongst those people is, is where companies can be really successful. Yeah, I think that is a great point. And as Chris mentioned, we work together and a lot of what we focus on at the end of the day is a lot of the behavioral aspects of making sure that that we're connecting with dog parents based on their behaviors, which really crosses over some age demographics quite a bit. So good transition on this, Chris. So you grew up in a dog, grew up in a dog family, dog lover all your life, have uh, you know spent a lot of time in the space with kind of an a slightly older demographic and certainly a younger demographic with Wikipedia. And how did you transition into, where did Retaliate first come from? How did you transition to the agency space and where's the focus now? So Retaliate first was, was actually kind of a side product of uh, what was great about the American Kennel Club was I was able to kind of build these side products that ultimately happened based on the situation that we were in. You know, it being an, a not-for-profit, it being not a innovation center, and anybody that's been at, at their headquarters, 260 Madison, I call it, you know, the mahogany maze. It's just mahogany. It's it's old pictures. <laughs> I got in trouble my first day because one of my prized possessions is, a, as I mentioned, I'm a big resident, a signed John Cena plaque. I wanted to pack down a $100,000 piece of dog artwork that I thought was hideous. It was giving me sort of bad feng shui in my office. You know, things like that. So it was so hard to attract talent. It was so hard to get people in. So you were always, anybody that you hired internally, you really were looking for up-and-comers, people that potentially had, you know, weren't necessarily seasoned and, and hadn't maybe fulfilled their, their full potential. And that's always a risky thing to do when you're, when you're team building and you're looking for things, especially in a culture like that where they don't let people go, right? You know, it's, it's, an, it's a not-for-profit. It's, it's people that have been there for a long time. So, you know, there's not a culture. There's the real person of getting that person out quickly, which is what you really need in, in kind of the for-profit world, you know, the the old adage of, you know, slow to hire, quick to fire is, is how people build, build teams right. successfully and, and have growth. So what Retaliate first was, was it was a way for me to get that talent on the outside at a more cost-effective way. Again, the not-for-profit side of the AKC was very tight on headcount, you know, one out, one in. And I couldn't drive the innovation. So I started to build this team that we outsourced elements to and used them as kind of an innovation arm because, again, it kept them away from the core brand. It allowed them to push the boundaries and do what was right. You know, one of our things in our ethos is it's about winning and it's about winning for your constituent and your, your people, right? So what really drove me and was important to me was how do we win for dogs, right? How do we make money for the company? Yes, but how do we do that by winning for dogs? And that's where, you know, sort of the retaliate first side of things, the Wolfopedia side could really push the boundaries. We didn't have to align ourselves to the core and we could ultimately drive growth at a much, a much quicker rate. So it, it got to the point, honestly, where sort of after a period of time, retaliate first was, was financially more viable for me. And I really struggled, to be honest with you, Dustin, on the puppy mill challenge. You know, that tore yeah. me. Again, going back to kind of, I have a great stress reliever where I, I watch old school wrestling. Again, wrestling comes into this, which is kind of weird. At late at night, if I'm, if I'm really stressed, and I got to the point where it, there was just something tearing at my conscience that I just didn't feel like I was on the right side of it. and I, I wasn't doing enough for dogs. I think I was helping dog people, but I don't think I was helping the dogs. That's where it was kind of like, you know, perfect time to say goodbye. That was, you know, the 
Jay-Z encore line just kept playing in my head. Now's the time to go. Now's the time to go. And we made the transition out, you know, and, and it, it allowed us to get involved with companies that we felt believed in what's right. You know, we work with people that are very much believing in, in pet parents, very much believe they're the guardians of the dog, understand, you know, the relationship between the human dog bond, and ultimately want to just love the one that they're with, right? They're not sitting there thinking like, hey, where did you get this dog or what did you do? You know, they're doing the right thing and, and, and they want to give those dogs rich, fulfilling lives. And and that's that's the good side of it, you know, and, and it's it's definitely been a lot less stress. It's definitely been much more enjoyable. And we put some fantastic points on the board. We have the second most pre-ordered pet product of all time. We've done some incredible things with, with Pup Joy where we had a, an amazing sort of Christmas run. We're working with a really good group of guys out of uh, Brooklyn, New York, who've, who've built, uh, they're called the Farmer's Dog. They're selling real human-grade dog food for, for your dog, like subscription service which is just awesome because it's like we all know we've all had the problems with, with things like kibble and stuff like that. We're, we're concerned about, you know, what are our dogs eating? And, and, you know, we work with the largest sort of doggy daycare in New York, the Spot Experience, Spot Canine Club. Uh, they've, we just rebranded to that name. You know, here are people that are, are out there and, and have, uh, you know, dog joggers and stuff like that going, you know, which are, are some ex-military uh, guys with PTSD that are out actually running with dogs to try to keep them healthy in the city. That's yeah, a real big right. focus for me at the, at the moment, like healthy dogs, right? How do you get that? You know, nutrition and exercise. So anybody that's kind of pushing the boundaries is, is something that's that's appealing to me. And, and I love what, you know, Pop Joy was really appealing because of your move on the organic. And I think that's that's a huge thing that's coming into the pet space. There has to be more kind of more kind of oversight and, and looking at things. We've had so many issues with, with treats from China. You, you know, you know all about that and, and issues of, of what you, you disrupted in the space by starting to get, you know, U.S. and, and healthy treats in there and how, how that's really moving things. And, and that's what we need. We need to put the dogs first. So folks, a couple things. One, Chris ran through a couple of uh, the other brands he works with. Some really cool companies. If, no, if you haven't taken a look at the farmer's dog, I think it's a really interesting concept, like super high quality, fresh delivered food for dogs. Nuzzle, wearable technology, really cool. And of course, with Spot, with some of the cool things they're doing with, with their service of dog walking. You know, and to your point on that, Chris, it's so one, I agree. Uh, obviously, you and I uh, are very like minded in some of this. And, you know, there are areas where I have passion around personally. But also, if you look at the industry by the numbers, one, it's a big growing industry. But secondly, when you really start diving into where the growth is coming from, consumers are driving and demanding a lot more transparency. They're driving quality health and wellness type of products for their dogs the same way they expect for themselves. And frankly, I love it from a self-serving standpoint because it's who we are as Pup Joy, but I also love just seeing the industry movement in a place where consumers are rewarding the companies that are doing the right things. And you know, I think it's interesting the cross section you guys get at Retaliate First with some of your clientele where you've got multiple businesses that are focusing on that. So let's, uh, with Retaliate, where do you guys, where's your focus as an agency? Where are the kind of the core competencies that you guys bring to bear, especially if there are any potential clients out there that are interested in chatting with you? Yeah, our, our focus and, and what we really became from is, is we're, we're blessed to have a 14 person team. So it's kind of all encompassing kind of market and acquisition growth and everything from sort of creative elements all the way through to just, you know, sort of performance marketers and people to grind things out. What we really look to do is, is kind of sit there and give people a cost effective way to come to market. One of the things that, that I saw, you know, at, at my time at, at AKC was when you hit them, um, you know, the pet trade shows, the super zoo and the global pet and stuff like that. And, and you'd kind of walk around and you'd see like a lot of really cool products. And then the next year you'd kind of come back and those people would be out of business. So where we really wanted to do it, and, and you know, because you know, I bugged you a lot to try to reach out to you. I was like, oh, Joy, so cool. Let me help, let me help, whatever I can do. That kind of stuff is, it's, we look at it as like, how can we help those companies kind of grow? And how can we help those companies have a fair shot and ultimately help them evolve into a point where they're self-sufficient, they're self-sustainable, they find out who their right audience is, they find out how to reach them at the most cost effect, they're, they're growing and scaling and, and what's the right way for them. You know, every situation is different. I think the agency model is just something that, that doesn't work. You know, people try to apply their sort of cookie cutter approach. What we really like to do is, you know, spend some time, understand what the client wants, what their customer is, and ultimately give them the best, most efficient approach that 
is purely based on client satisfaction, right? You know, we don't believe in in sort of being in situations where people aren't happy, and, and that's what we look for. We look for people that are really excited about working with us and are, are really happy with what we're doing. If they're not happy, we just ask they give us a chance to, to get them happy. We've never been in a situation where that's occurred, but but that's the challenge, right, is is finding these for us. It's We look to find companies. You know, we, we love it when people reach out and talk to us, but... You know, it's finding companies that are that are exciting, that are moving in the right way, that have the right teams, and but again, that that understand that true definition of of a pet parent, right? Of of, and they want to fulfill the dog's lives by doing it in the right way. When you have that kind of like perfect storm, it's very easy for guys like us to kind of come in there and help you reach those people because the brand is built in the right way. There's a genuineness, and there's a core belief in doing the right thing. Finding customers isn't hard when you when you have that and you're loyal. One of the big mistakes we see is people coming into this space, though, and, and why so many people have failed. Not to, to you know digress onto that, but they just come across with these very disingenuous elements, right? They try to sort of go from zero to sixty far too quickly, you know, and, and push the market and slogans, push push the little the, the gitchy elements, and the pet parent, you know, reacts on an emotional level. You know, it's, they want to do what's right for their dog, and, and they're going to do their research. They're going to do things. You're not going to get the quick seals, you know, by just catching people off guard. You know, I mean, you have to spend that time nurturing that relationship, but that's what's great. The lifetime value of the customers in this space is, is incredible because people are so incredibly loyal. Yeah, I would echo what you said there. Right? That today's consumer is a very... It's a very intelligent, educated, and empowered consumer, probably more so than compared to any other time in the past. And I completely agree with what you're saying in terms of, you know, companies thriving on authentic transparency versus possibly some of the marketing tactics from, you know, some of what we've seen in the past. And and I will, before we dive any more into that, I, I'll give you a bit of kudos for anybody who potentially is interested in talking to Chris. I personally came from about a decade of working at advertising agencies and then being on the hiring side for a number of advertising agencies. Working with Chris and his team is, it's been one of the best experiences I've had with agencies. It's a very frictionless relationship. You know, we talk as almost daily as friends and counterparts and and they're also, they've done a lot of great work with us. So kudos to you and your team on that, Chris. So that means a lot. No, it's been, it's (laughs) been enjoyable. (laughs) Absolutely. So I want to get back a little bit to some of the stuff you're saying. So You've got a good cross-section of seeing the industry, and you have for quite some time. Where do you see as some of the biggest common challenges, both across your clients, but just industry-wide, is this pet industry is growing and evolving? So the high-level one is the challenge that we saw at the AKC, right? There is that kind of animal welfare, animal rights sort of battle sway, right? And I think what companies have to do that are that are in the product space or in the necessity spaces, they have to move away from that. I think they have to be for all dog owners. It's it's the the mantra you and I kind of always went, you know, agreed upon. It was the love the one that you're with, right? And and put yeah. people in that kind of right situation. That's obviously the first challenge. You know, we've seen Pedigree's a great example. Pedigree was sponsoring the major dog shows like the Westminster Kennel Club. They moved away from that. They became very rescue centric. You know, and that's a pretty clean split, right? But 55% of the dogs in America are purebred, but 45% would be would be mixed breed. So there's no need to kind of take either side. You have to get into that love of the one you with or else you're, you're damaging yourself by, by fragmenting your audience. So I think that is number one. I think n- number two in the big challenge is is the saturation, right? I think that there there's a lot of stuff kind of coming to market that, that makes it a pretty competitive playing field. And I think that's where, you know, having your idea, having your ideology, your ethos, who are you, what are you about, defining that and then working it through. Find the niche audience and then grow and build it. That's where you can build for the long term and have a lot of success. And then I think the third big challenge is, like, I hate to jump on the fake news element, but there's <laughs> so much data in the pet space, right? Like, there's just, we've all seen these, like, I read an article the other day from a, a company that, um, I don't want to name them, but they sent an article out saying 10% of dogs have heart disease. And it's like, I have never seen that stat. And I've worked with, with vets from Auburn, Penn, everywhere. I've never heard that, right? You know, most of us with bigger breed dogs, we know that, you know, ultimately heart disease or cancer is likely to claim those dogs. That's, a, you know, people sort of 70%. But 
there's been so much lack of data, right? There's not a lot of data on shelters, right? There's not a lot of data on purebred dogs because there's so many breeds. You know, AKC now um, recognizes, I believe it's over 200 breeds now. So when you get down to the micro level, there's, there's not a lot of sample sets. You know, there's, there's breeds that they represent where there's only sort of two, 3,000 dogs in the U.S. Right, so it becomes very hard for these factual points, and there's there's a lot of difference between a golden retriever and a bulldog. So that becomes these elements. So you get so much of these, you know, fake news, fake data, sweeping comments that you know is being pushed out to pet owners that that is not necessarily the right information for them, right? And I think that's a challenge. And I think the fourth challenge is disrupting the bigger brands that are in there. And I think that's where there's a huge piece of opportunity. And one of the things that, that I see a lot is people saying, well, why wouldn't Mars do this? Or why wouldn't Purina do this? And the truth is, is they're looking for people to innovate. They're looking for people to come to the table and do stuff that they haven't thought about. You know, and those guys are making some really great acquisitions. They, they made the acquisition of Whistle last year. They acquired Greenies a couple of years ago. You know, so there's, there's big opportunities for, for people to come to the space, be aggressive, play for things, and then actually find really nice, lucrative exits and, you know, use those brands to potentially reach more people. Those are really the four key points for, for people wanting to get into the space. That's really great perspective. So let me ask you this. Let's get a little more tactical on that. So if we've got some of the audience who are running smaller local businesses or potentially smaller startups and they're swimming trying to get their head around, like, what do I do with marketing? I'm feeling underwater on it. What are a couple pieces of advice you would give in terms of like the best places for those folks to to focus their efforts initially? Absolutely, 110% start on Facebook. You know, the, the Facebook advertising platform is phenomenal. Pet owners are there. There's so many other big brands that may be applicable that now have their own custom audiences. You know, so these are potential people for you to, you know, mingle with, showcase your product in front of. You know, many people will recommend, you know, display advertising. They'll recommend Google search. But the truth is, is Facebook gives you a much, much better level of, of being able to put your message, message across with kind of the visual elements. You know, one of the things I always push people really hard on is like, you basically have supermodels all over the place with dogs, right? No, you know, dog pictures are the most loved things of, of all time, right? Yeah. Now. So use that visual component that you can get from it. Use the behavioral elements that Facebook gives you. You know, you can go in there, you can create custom audiences. They allow you to kind of, you know, even target people, you know, other brands and, and people that you think may like your product as well. Those are things that just aren't on, aren't on Google, right? You know, that Google hasn't reached that, that point. And then you can also sort of import your own customer list and have, have Facebook search for people that match similar data points. So that's usually how we recommend building your paid strategy. Start on Facebook, then move it out into Google. Then finally, if, when you're scaling, look into display. Sometimes agencies will recommend it the other way, but, and, and you have to kind of look at that because that's where agencies have moved from, right? You know, you, early stages of internet, it was display, then it moved into Google, then it moved into social advertising. And that's what's, what's very important when you're selecting an agency. Make sure the agency is making the best recommendation for you and not the best recommendation for the agency. Because <laughs> sometimes they want to do what they know. Good tips. And for anybody listening, um, at the end of this, we'll wrap up with both contact information for Chris and myself. You're welcome to reach out to either one of us if you have any follow-up questions. I know if you're a relatively new user with Facebook advertising, it can seem a bit overwhelming as you get started. But trust me, once you get your feet under you, there are a lot of things that you can do pretty efficiently and effectively within Facebook's tools. And Chris and I will both be happy to provide any advice if have, people have questions on that. Kind of follow-up to that, Chris. So if it's a business that's... Um, they have a lot of focus on younger demographics and they're, they're sitting there with the mindset of, yeah, Facebook's great and it hits maybe some of my demographic, but I've got a lot of the people that I try to attract, especially the millennial type audience moving on to Instagram or Snapchat or, and they just don't know how to get their arms around that. What advice do you have for that? Um, I think what to do is, is, you know, test the channel, you know, play with it yourself. If you're having fun with it, if you're seeing stuff that you like, then potentially move your business in there. I'm not a huge believer in Snapchat, right? I think Snapchat is 
very much about the, the privatization of yep. sort of social. And what I mean by that is kind of it's, it's the younger audience, right? So you look at kind of the behaviorals through generations. I sit in what would be classed as, as Gen Z. I'm very much a millennial. I'm still outgoing. I'm still sharing things. I want people to see what I'm doing. Generation Alpha, the, the, the generation below me, which includes a lot of sort of teenagers and people in their early 20s, they tend to want to keep things a bit more private. So Snapchat was originally driven on sending messages privately between communities, similar to like a like how WhatsApp and, and your groups are. So I think that's a, a tougher audience because I don't think it's an audience that's naturally ingrained to want to buy through that channel. That's why sort of Facebook is, is really the key because people are willing to buy that. You know, brands have, have made millions and millions of dollars off of, of selling through Facebook, right? So, and desktop is still trumping, you know, search is moving more mobile, but transactionally desktop is still trumping for the majority of brands in the pet space. So I think that is that is a key component. But yeah, you know, to go back to the point, test every channel yourself personally. If you feel like it's working, if you feel like it's a fit for you, then it'll be your brand. It, it will be for your brand because the majority of people and their, their companies, their brand is a reflection of them. You know, Dustin, you and I talked about that, how you and Bill were Popjoy, right? And like Popjoy's yep. voice was, was you guys, Charlie, you, you're your wonderful pit bull is is the voice of the company and, and he's an extension of you right we all do that voice for our our dogs you know to make everybody in the house laugh kind of thing so exactly. that's that's the side of it and, and i think that's a great point a great place to start because it's natural and it's authentic good thanks chris with that we are we're unfortunately out of time i think we could go with this one for a lot for a while but we have to cut it off so one i want to thank you chris uh it was great to have you on the show of course, I want to thank our producer, Mark Winter, for making all the magic happen behind the scenes. Chris, for folks that do want to reach out to you that have any questions, what's the best way to reach you? Honestly, message me through Teddy's Instagram. That's where, that's where I have the most fun. He's, uh, it's Instagram, Teddy Hugo Walker. He's, uh, I'm a huge Tottenham Hotspur fan, a soccer team out of England, and he's named after Teddy Sheringham, one of their great strikers, and Hugo Lloris, their French goalkeeper. So it was not Teddy Bear, as a lot of people thought. He's uh, Teddy Hugo Walker after, after two Tottenham greats. Cute. And uh, everybody should go check out Teddy's Instagram account. He is uh, He's quite a cutie. And as always, you can reach me at Dustin at PupJoy.com. That's P-U-P-J-O-Y.com at PupJoy on all major social media and online at PupJoy.com. Chris, thanks again. And to all the listeners, happy tales to you until we meet again. Let's Talk Pets every week on demand only on PetLifeRadio.com.